Before I start this video, I want you to understand that we are whittling down the number of reactions that we have to learn in this module. Yeah, there's very few left of them, but we've talked about quite a few already, and I think that's enough, isn't it? The acid addition, the water addition, the alcohol addition, the mercury additions, the hydroboration oxidations. Well, there's going to be a few left, a handful, not too many more. And the next one that we're going to focus on is what you're seeing on the screen, and it's called a peroxy acid. Well, what is a peroxy acid? If you think of peroxy, you might think of peroxide. And peroxide, what we've seen in the uh, previous video, is H2O2, hydroboration oxidation used it, right? Well, peroxide, which is called hydrogen peroxide, is just one type of peroxide. Yeah, peroxides happen everywhere. There's tons of different ones. Hydrogen peroxide is the one that you know the most. And in addition to this, we're taking something like a peroxide, we gotta figure out what that is, and then we're adding the word acid on it. So a peroxy and then an acid. Well, if we look at hydrogen peroxide, we see it's H2O2. And there's two oxygens here. The way that this is ordered up is something that looks like this, all right? And the second hydrogen, of course, is going to be written over here in a way. All right, well, I only want to focus on the peroxide piece. And there we go. Well, if we add on the term acid, what we're basically saying is that this hydrogen that we have maybe there will be acidic in nature. Folks, module two material right there. So if I can donate the proton, this donated proton is going to start behaving like an acid. We label it as an acid in the name. So this is a magic moment where I'm going to take peroxide here that has the hydrogen that carries with it. And then I'm going to take the term of an acid, and I'm going to force this to donate the proton. Now, how do we do that? We need an electron withdrawing group. Oh, electron withdrawing groups. I remember saying something about those in the last lecture module, right? I mean, we talked about these electron withdrawing groups and how they suck electrons through and how they can kind of donate protons a little bit better. Yeah, we also talked about the acid and bases as well. So a peroxy acid suits that purpose. What is the structure of a peroxy acid? A peroxy acid is, well, let me change my pink, my red color, R, O, or sorry, C, double bond O, 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 H. Now you're probably looking at this and you are remembering flashbacks of module two when we talked about acids and bases and so forth. The reason that I say that is because this looks very similar to something else that we've seen and that was a double bond O, O, H. We call this group a carboxylic acid group, right? That's what we called that. That was the functional group that we learned back in the day. Well, the difference here is that this peroxy acid is very similar with one exception. It has an extra oxygen that's in there. That extra oxygen is going to cause these peroxy acids to react and to do things that a carboxylic acid maybe would not do. That extra oxygen, look at this, this oxygen is electronegative, right up here at the very top, okay? So that's going to be an electron polar. Well, this oxygen here, that's also electronegative, that's an electron polar. This oxygen's electronegative, that's an electron polar. Folks, 
this carbon's getting tugged of war now between two different areas of the molecule. But in addition to that, we have two electronegatives that are back to back, side by side. You talk about bad neighbors. There you go. I mean, these neighbors just can't stand each other. They're going to sabotage each other, bust out their windows and everything every day, all day long. Those oxygens just hate each other for being that close. Well, as you can imagine, this is also going to help determine the reactions of the peroxy acids. So what type of reactions do peroxy acids do? Well, we're talking about the world of alkene. This is where we're going to start. So I'm just going to write an R, and then off of this is a CH double bond CH2. So an alkene. I keep it simple. And then I'm going to react with this a peroxy acid. So I'm just going to write an R again because anything could be here. It doesn't really matter. It can be a really long carbon chain. It could be a ring. I don't care what it is. It's just something random. But we're going to put a focus on the peroxy acid piece. And that is this. C double bond O, 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 H. And what gets formed out of this reaction? This is what I want you to imagine. One of these oxygens in the COOH comes over, looks at the double bonds in the carbon, and will latch on to each one. And it destroys the double bond when it does that. So what we end up with products here is an R with a CH, CH2. This was a double bond, but now it's no more. And one of these oxygens from this peroxy acid group latches on to those carbons and forms this three-way. Again, a love triangle, maybe. That's how you want to look at it. And that oxygen doesn't let go. That oxygen saying, I'm here. And you're going to have to deal with it. Whether you like it or not. You invited me. And now I'm staying. Well, if it does that, the oxygen, one of them, has been removed from the peroxy acid. Right? So what we end up with now over here is a C double bond O. But now just an OH. Not an OOH. And this is going to generate a carboxylic acid. So this will always be one of our products from this type of reaction. We will always end up with a carboxylic acid. But we also have to name this. This is a functional group. This oxygen that's involved in this triangle of love, well, that is called an epoxide. That's how we refer to that as. You probably have heard of pero or epoxides. Epoxides are very commonly found in the hardware department. And one of the first things that people think of with epoxides are things like epoxide glues and stuff. Okay, well, there you go. All epoxides have a very similar structure, and that similar structure is this oxygen that is involved in this three-way relationship with two other carbons. And it's okay with that. They need a reality TV show. It's fine. Epoxides are pretty stable. Epoxides can react. Epoxides can break open. Later on down the road, we're going to see some of this. But this is how we form an epoxide. Now the question, always the question, is mechanism, right? Um, what on earth are we going to do about mechanisms? Well, this is what goes on. Very similar to some of the later mechanisms that we have seen so far. So here is the peroxy acid, my C double bond OOOH, right? And I told you that one of these oxygens will go in and attack this double bond. So that's what they're showing you here. This is kind of latching on at the same time. Very similar to bromine. Very similar to the mercuries and some of the other ones that we have discussed so far at this point. 
And if you look at this thing, they're labeling this as an electrophile. Oh, what? An electrophile? We thought electrophile was supposed to be positive. We thought electrophiles should not have these negative pairs of electrons. Well, you see, the issue here is that this OH group from the peroxy acid, uh, this is going to completely rearrange. And all of this happens at one time. So what really goes on here is that this carbon and this oxygen and this oxygen begins to suck those electrons through. And this poor little oxygen's just outnumbered. I mean, if you think of tug of war, you've got two pulling on one side and one pulling on the other. Who do you think's going to win? That's right. I mean, unless you got Hercules over here, and that's no Hercules. That's just a little oxygen. Poor little thing. How puny. Well, that oxygen's going to lose. All right. So this oxygen pulls the electrons with the help of this one pulls the electrons from here and breaks that bond, all right? It breaks the bond. So this OH group goes off, and it is now electronless. Folks, that is how it gets the positive charge there. This is an OH at this point in time, but this oxygen is becoming positive, and that's because the electrons are getting ripped away from it, and those electrons are getting shoved down in between this oxygen and this carbon to create this newly found double bond, because this is where that first OH group was at, and this has now been cleaved. This piece is going to go on to react, and these electrons get shoved down here to make this extra bond that is now a double bond. All right, so that's kind of the first step of that mechanism, but it really all happens at once. So what we see here is that this oxygen is now positive. It kind of comes into the presence of this double bond, and it says, ooh, negative. I like negatives. And electronegativity plays a role in this as well. The issue, though, is that this carbon, if it gets this double bond, now has five bonds in total. It has a newly formed one here that's a double. It already had a double, so that's a total of four. And then it has this one to some kind of random carbon group. So that's my fifth one. This carbon's overwhelmed. This carbon can't take all the pressure. So it says, okay, I've got to rearrange. I've got to do something. This is not going to work for me. I just formed this bond here because that oxygen forced me to do it. And this oxygen says, oh, well, that's not a problem. You know, I see this hydrogen right out here that was on this OH group in the beginning. And you know what? I really like that hydrogen. And that hydrogen's slightly positive. And then here's some negative sources. And I'm electronegative. So I think I really like this hydrogen and I like to play with them for a while. Okay, so the double bond breaks, and that's why we see the arrow, the negative source, pointing to the positive piece, and it rips that hydrogen off, and it forms this OH group. Folks, this is the formation of the carboxylic acid. C double bond O, OH. There is my carboxylic acid. But I want you to understand that the whole thing rearranged. You know, a couple of minutes ago, I said, just... Imagine one of these oxygens sitting down on top of that double bond, breaking it and forming a three-way. That was a very simplified version of what happens in this reaction. If you really want to know the details, here it is. And some of you might not want to know the details. But that's how this process works. It completely rearranges on itself. I mean, this is no small feat. There's a lot of activity that's going on here. The oxygen's attracted to the double bond because we get electron pulling through the molecule. This weakens the bond between the two oxygens. They already hate each other anyway, so they don't need a lot of persuasion to break that bond. Those electrons get shoved down between the carbon and the oxygen to form the new double bond that we have there. And carbon says, I've got too many. I've got to break something. What am I going to break? And this oxygen says, don't worry. I got your back. I'll fix this problem. And it takes its double bond, destroys it, and those electrons are used to pair up with the H to form the carboxylic acid group. What we then have left over is just the oxygen now 
just the oxygen that gets spit off of this reaction, and that oxygen goes and sandwiches between the two carbons. The question is why? Well, keep in mind that we've always said that oxygen really locks two bonds and two sets of electrons, two pairs. Well, it has the two pairs. There's one pair, there's two pairs, and the two bonds, one from that carbon and one from that carbon. Also, oxygen is notoriously known to be into bent molecules. That's just the preferred position that it likes to be in, folks. So we saw that with water. We saw that with things like SiO2 as far as maybe TLC plates, stationary phases and stuff. So this oxygen, it's not in a very uncomfortable position. It's almost natural for it to be like that in a bent shape. All right, now let's take a look at some nomenclature. Before we go on and talk about more reactions with peroxy acids, let's take a look at nomenclature and figure out how we can name these epoxides that will be forming in this reaction because this is a functional group that we haven't seen yet. All of the other things we've seen, alcohols, ethers, the halogens, we knew how to new, uh, name those. We don't really know how to name epoxides. But I promise you, they're going to be uh, kind of easy, right? Okay, now I just say kind of, kind of. I hope that doesn't make you too worried. So let's start with our double bond. Okay, so CH2 and CH2. There we go. Also note, you could do this, CH2 double bond CH2. I don't get mad at this, but you got to realize that that double bond is not connected to those hydrogens. That double bond's connected to those carbon. And that's why people do it this way, because it's the carbon double bonded to that carbon. So that's why they kind of sometimes write these flipped versus what you would normally do. Okay, so if we had to name this, what would we name it? Well, this isn't an epoxide. I know it's not. Just give me some time. This double bond is an alkene. This is a two-carbon chain. So we would call this F but we would drop the E and we would add ethene, A and switch it with an E, and we would call it ethene. Okay, well, there's a common name that's also associated with this. Ethene is the IUPAC name. Okay, so what else are we going to call it then? Well, they just do something a little silly. They put ethylene in here instead. That's kind of the common name that it goes by. So this is perfectly okay. Remember, I told you, molecules can go by more than one different name. That's perfectly okay. It's like nicknames for them. You've got nicknames maybe with your friends. Molecules have nicknames too because they have friends. And they want you to be their friend too. So ethene or ethylene, either one of those are fine. So in the world of epoxides, sometimes, sometimes when we go and name them, we might see something that looks like this. We see this CH2 and then a CH2, and then this oxygen is sandwiched in between those two carbons. And let's say that's all there is. Nothing more complicated than that. Carbon has four bonds. Oxygen has two with a set of electrons, two sets of electrons. Everybody's happy. How would we name this? Well, we could use this ethylene as part of this process. And we could call this ethylene and then the O oxide. There we go. That's perfectly okay to do if I'm going to name it a common name. But notice this is a very simple molecule. Right, very simple molecule that we have there. Okay, well, what if we increase our carbon number? And let's just draw that as an example as well. Uh, we have a carbon, double bond, CH, CH3. Well, we would call this one propene, and that's the IUPAC name for that. This also comes to us in form of a common name, though, as well. Didn't talk about that, but it does. And this could be called, guess what? Propylene, just like ethylene up here. 
So if we take that piece, and let's say that we do three carbons, the double bond was here, and that double bond is broken, and on those two carbons is where the oxygen goes to make an epoxide, how would we name that epoxide? Remember, we're not talking about reactions yet. It's just all about how to name them first. How would we name it? Well, we could do the same thing that we did before. We could say that this is a propylene oxide. Notice oxide is going to be used to represent that oxygen. So whenever we get these type of simple molecules, nothing else on them too much, this is one way, one way that we could name them. The problem, though, is that after we go past three, we have an issue. Butylene can't really use the term butylene. And the reason is because ethylene represents F, two carbons, and a double bond. There's only one way that that can go on there. Propylene, propylene represents three carbons, prop, one, two, three. And the ene represents a double bond. There's only one way that this can be attached. If it goes over here, it's the same molecule, folks. It's just been flipped. So there's no ambiguity here. I'm going to get the same no matter what I do. The issue is with four carbons. If I go to a four carbon chain, and let's do CH2, CH, CH2, CH3, and the O is here. I can't call it butylene. And the reason is because the double bond could have happened here between carbon 1 and carbon 2, or it could have happened between carbon 2 and carbon 3. I need to be more specific. Butylene is just not going to cut it. There's ambiguity there. Where is that double bond? Because the presence of that double bond does make it a different molecule now. So we have to be more specific with the nomenclature that we use here. So how do we do this? Well, the longest carbon chain is bute. So we will write down butane. On carbon 1 and carbon 2 of that long carbon chain, this is where I see that oxygen. This is where my epoxide is going to be located, right? So to represent that in the name, what I do is I'll do a 1, 2 to give you the location of where those are at. And I'll write the word epoxy. 1, 2, epoxy, butane. Folks, that's all that we got to do to it. Hopefully that wasn't as bad as what you thought it was going to be. So let's do another example. Let's do maybe CH3, CH, CH, CH3, and an oxygen here that is the epoxide piece. How do we name it? Use the same rules as what we just did above. Longest carbon chain is four. So this is a butane. And then on carbon 2 and on carbon 3, that is where the epoxide group begins to be formed. So this is called a 2,3 epoxy butane. That's all, folks. That's all that we have to do to name epoxides. These are IUPAC names. This is what they would really like for you to use. However, they do have some common names as well. I can show you those common names, and we'll start with the one up at the very top. I think you're going to like the IUPAC names much better, though. It's one of the reasons that we use IUPAC. So let's talk about common. So I'm going to write IUPAC here. This is the preferred name. That's what we would prefer you to write down. So let's look at the common names. What's the common name for this structure? Well, it's going to be called 2 ethyl oxyrane. Oh my gosh. What on earth? Where did that even come from? Well, 
the way common names work with epoxides, the oxy rain, that represents the oxy ring, and that is here. That is what that represents, oxy rain. Well, in carbon number two, because that would be carbon one, this is carbon two. At carbon number two, I have a substituent that's hanging off, and that substituent is an ethyl group. And that is where the two ethyl comes into play. That is how we generate common names for epoxides. A little bit more confusing. Maybe. Maybe you look at that and maybe that makes better sense to you. And if so, great. You love common names for epoxides. But studies have shown over years that we really don't prefer that way. That IUPAC people tend to associate with a little bit better. And they would look at this and say carbon 1 and 2 with the long carbon chain. That is where this epoxide group is going to be located. So we call it 1,2 epoxy. Same way down here. Four carbon chain, two and three, two, three epoxy, because that's where that group is at. This group, though, also has a common name. How do we common name this? Well, this is going to be called a two, three, dimethyl oxy rain. What? Yeah, oxy rain is going to represent this piece. There we go. This 2 and 3 represents that this is the second and third carbon of the chain. That is where the oxy ring is at. And then on carbon 2, I have a methyl group. And on carbon 3, I have a methyl group. And that's why we call it 2,3-dimethyl oxy rain. I know, folks, no one said that this was going to be too easy. But there's an example of common names and probably an example of why we don't use common names for epoxides. Uh, let's look at another one. We'll do CH2 and we'll do carbon. We'll do an oxygen like this. And this carbon will do a CH3 maybe and a CH3 there. So we want to IUPAC it. We want to name them. When, you know, we've not talked about reactions yet. We're just learning how to name these groups when they do form. Longest carbon chain, doesn't really matter. You can go up or down. I'm just going to go down with it. It gives me the same number of carbons. One, two, three. So this is going to be a propane. Well, on carbon one and on carbon two, that is where my epoxy group is at, right? And on carbon two, that's also where a methyl group is at. Remember alphabetical order, E comes before M. No big deal if you forget it, but one, two epoxy and then two methyl propane that is going to be the IUPAC name for that epoxide common name it does have a common name how do we do that well I look at this structure and this is called oxy rain all right so oxy rain there we go and then on carbon two because in the numbering of the long carbon chain, that's where these substituents are going to be, carbon 2, I have a methyl and a methyl. So I call this 2,2-dimethyl-oxy-rain. There's your IUPAC, and there's your common name for it. Something else I want to say before we talk about reactions, we use a common peroxy acid here. And this is what the structure looks like. This is abbreviated MCPBA. MCPBA. And this is the peroxy acid that they love to use as an example because it's very easy to get. It's very cheap. It's commonly used. So why not show you the structure of what we normally use in a laboratory environment? So MCPBA is the peroxy acid that they will use most often in these reactions. And sometimes they will give you the structure and they will say, what's the product? Sometimes they will give you the abbreviation. They will say, 
say what's the product. Sometimes they will just write down peroxy acid and they'll say what's the product. And sometimes they will write down what the MC PBA stands for. They'll give you the name and it stands for meta chloro peroxy benzoic acid. So benzoic represents the benzene ring that you're seeing here with the conjugated double bond system. There's the chloro group that's part of the name. And here is the peroxy acid that's part of the structure. C double bond O, 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 H. And meta because that's the locations of those groups. We call this the meta position of each other. You don't know that yet. That's going to be much later on, maybe in the second part of an organic chemistry class. We talk about ortho groups, meta groups, para groups, and so forth. So this is meta position. So that's what MCPBA stands for. Meta, chloro, peroxy, benzoic acid. So either one of these, they can give them to you folks, and I don't want you to be confused with them. So there's the structure, sometimes they'll write it. There's the abbreviation, sometimes they'll use that. There's the peroxy acid term in general, sometimes they do that. And sometimes they'll write meta chloroperoxybenzoic acid out just to see if they can confuse you with the questions. That's what all of this is about, folks. That's what all of this is about. So peroxy acids, we know that peroxy acid makes an epoxide, we know it rearranges, and we know that oxygen, one of these oxygens, that one highlighted, is going to eventually go on to the double bond, break it, and latch on to both of those carbons at one time. All right, so in the next video, we'll continue on with this discussion. 30 minutes in, I'm almost done, almost.